What's up, Vortex Nation? As you all know, we've discussed with Ryan Muckenhern, we had Trent here as a special guest for this Vortex Extreme. We've now discussed everything that we need in order to reload our own ammunition. Mark, uh, still still perhaps wondering why exactly we're not just going with the boxes of 20 that come conveniently at the store. Uh, but we're, we're going to be doing this, Mark. And the method that we are likely going to be using is kind of that middle tier. We're going to be using a single-stage press uh, along with a uh, tumbler thingamajig and a thingamajig that spits out the stuff that, that lights on fire. Um, the, the, ma- the makies of the ammo. Yeah, you know. The folks across the table from us at this point, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see them here, are far more knowledgeable, I think, about what we're about to talk about than we are, and that's why we brought them on here. Again, just a lot of folks interested in the topic of reloading. And the actual gear itself is is an interesting topic, for sure, because not everybody knows what do I need, what's excessive that I don't necessarily need, what is something that I absolutely need. And then the actual topic of going out and shooting reloads is cool because you get to shoot guns and stuff. But how about just the idea of finding your node, figuring out the testing of what you actually load? Chances are you're not just going to go sling some powder in a case, throw some primers in there, put a bullet in, and it's going to be magic, right? And Doubtful. so that's why these guys are here. We'll introduce them. Normally it's alphabetical order, but this is a lot of letters for me to think about, and I don't, I can't say the alphabet that <laughs> My last fast. Name's three letters. Um, <laughs> so we have Tony, we have Ryan, and we have Nick Loffenberg, who has been on before. But Ryan Hay and Tony Paulskill are new to the podcast, so that's pretty cool. We'll have, uh, we'll have you guys introduce yourselves. What? Wait, R and T, A B C D. What comes first? R or T? I can't even remember. R. R. Okay. Ryan, you're are you going to the mall later? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> Ryan, hey, I, uh, I work with Magneto Speed. Been working there for just under five years, um, and customer service, technical support, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, answer all the phone calls, all the emails that come in, go out to the matches, represent Magneto Speed and a couple other companies, and make sure that uh, customers are taken care of, and they also know. Uh, the, the rights and wrongs when it comes to our products, also getting all the releases out and everything else. Awesome. R- real quick, uh, so what are what are the types of products? I'm sure we'll exactly. get into those okay. products in depth, but you know, what kind of products are you guys producing? We're mainly known for the chronographs. Uh, okay. That's how the company started out. Um, quick history lesson, we were born out of the University of Texas IT lab. Our owners were working on the Navy Railgun program with electromagnetics, and they saw the avenue for commercial. And then we started out with the V1, quickly went to the V2, then we went to the V3, and then we brought the Sporter to market. And that's the chronological order of the chronographs that have hit the market. Mm-hmm. And we're likely going to be using, I mean, we are going to be using chronographs, very mm-hmm. likely magneto speeds, which we've liked quite a bit. I think that's been one of the things that we've even discussed in some of the past long range episodes, I believe, just having an accurate, good chronograph that's giving you accurate data as far as your velocities go, and magneto speed has definitely been one of those. Um, if you've ever been to the range and you've looked down the line and somebody out there is testing and they have what looks like a scary-looking, weird, futuristic bayonet thing tied to their front of their rifle scope, or, I mean, th- their rifle's barrel, that's that's a magneto speed. Um, I'm surprised you guys, do you guys ever get people coming after you to, like, ban magneto speed just because they look scary? I mean, people, <laughs> no, try, no, people not try banning uh, everything because they look scary. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We, we, we've had a couple of comments where people say, oh, look at that. It's a bayonet. You know, you're going <laughs> to charge someone with it. But no, it's no, no one's tried to ban it. Okay. Um, at, internationally, though, sometimes when we ship to, to France and other companies and we have on the product description ballistic, it, it wigs out some customs and, and okay. import. And they, oh, interesting. Yeah. And then they realize you can't put a barrel shroud on it and you're fine. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it it, it's it just it's funny because you know certain countries. Huh? It doesn't take a pistol grip, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> no magazine. It's not the shoulder thing that goes up. <laughs> no, the bump right. <laughs> it's right. not a bump stock. <laughs> no, so uh, so. before we go down that rabbit trail too heavily, I, that that is excellent. We'll be relying on you quite a bit for understanding this because a lot of the people I'm sure you deal with in your job day to day are testing. A lot of their, I mean, that's it's, it's testing it's ammunition. Hunters, competition, military, law enforcement. Uh, every application of precision rifle, I get the phone calls in. Um, awesome. So it, I, one minute I can be talking to industry professionals like yourselves, David Tubb, and then the next minute I'll get a phone call from, 
you know, Asheville, North Carolina, when someone's testing their new hunting rifle out and they need need help with it. So Sweet. it's it runs the gamut of every application in precision rifle. Perfect. Well, glad we have you on here, and also glad we have Tony on here. Tony, what uh, what can you say about like an introduction for mm. people on the podcast here? What's allowed? Well, uh, so I'm a military based um, individual, but uh, my my big kind of passion that I got rolling into was uh, the PRS side uh, because of my job. It, it directly correlated and to what I had done in the past it uh it helped the military um and that's kind of the the nice thing with the military piece is is that a lot of things that we're pulling out from doing PRS truly goes back and relates directly uh to almost doctrine of of the training that we bring back to the table for the students that are coming um down the tube and uh you kind of the you kind of you gave the nice part about it is that you're a lot of a lot of times you're able to dispel a lot of myths. Like uh, 308 will go to a mile. Well, the 308 will definitely go to a mile because uh, the bull will go, definitely go that far. It's about back, uh, back in the day, it was like 34 mils of elevation. Hmm. You, get, you get a 308 with 175 Sierras out to a mile. Um, now with the guns that we transitioned to a different uh, weapon system, shorter barrel, less muzzle velocity, it's a little more than that. It's been a couple of years since I've uh, ran one to a uh, to a mile, but uh, 18 by 36 inch target, uh, no issues with uh, 308. So it's it's a very capable cartridge. I know Ryan runs them uh, PRS uh, side, so uh, I stopped doing it you about three away? years ago. Well, yeah, last uh, 2017, 2018, that's all I was strictly running. Now, when you shoot 308, is there like some sort of, uh, I don't know, like um, period kind of old school reenactments uh, <laughs> sort of uh, class that you're in? Is no, everybody and, dressed uh, up in, in red and blue coats and sort yeah, of I, standing I, Jim, that's why they make bayonets. Yeah, that's why. Oh, right. you know, sure. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I go back to the brother. days of wearing old BDUs and DCUs because okay. that was the, the era, <laughs> you know, old, old Army Greens. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did 16 years in the Army, so 308 was kind of the prevalent, and then, course 2009 rolled around and you start seeing the 6.5 creeds and everything else coming out yeah um and how quickly we've advanced um but for prs uh it, it's expensive to to change barrels like tires and i uh by coincidence or fate whatever i had to switch to my 308 which was my backup training rifle in 2017 because i had no six millimeter six fives ready to go and I said, okay, I'll finish the 2017 out in TAC division. You know, I made the finale. And then I said, all right, 2018, let's make another run at it. Did a lot better. And um, then finally I had enough saved up, and then I just started buying barrels, and I'm like, all right, back to 6 millimeter. And switching from 308 back to 6 millimeter, and then going to 308 again really exposes a lot of where your weaknesses are oh, at. Oh, okay. Because you're switching from the heavy recoil to a light mm-hmm. recoil, and then when you go back to that heavy recoil, and you're like, you're like, wow, yeah, what, yeah. what, what is wrong here? What's going on? A little bit less forgiving if oh, you're uh, just and, slightly out of place. And then a 308 gas gun's even even more uh, unforgiving. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, you gotta have the fundamentals pretty ironed out. Yeah, yeah, you gotta have your shot process and follow through and everything. Great for a gas gun. It's I mean, yeah. if you want to train, train off a gas gun in 308. Hmm. Noted. There's no. a tip. Yep. Um, Tony, to your point earlier, what you were saying as well is we've we've had a couple of folks who are professional marksmen uh, for military applications. I I, I don't yeah. know mm-hmm. what political or how politically I, per, correct I have to be when I say mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But they came out to the Vortex Extreme, and they were even commenting how a lot yeah. of those guys are starting to do more civilian style competitions because it's actually honing their skills. Yeah. Quite a bit, Ab- absolutely. Like uh, like Ryan was saying, um, the amount of of uh, non uh, PRS running, non prone is um, essential. Um, and to to know how to run that gun, like I stopped shooting three hundred eight in in two thousand twelve. I went transition over to a two hundred sixty from uh, a couple individuals out in the NorCal group uh, got me on to shooting that, and an individual uh, uh, up at Bartline. I said, "Hey, run into a 260," and I figured, "Well, since I'm," but I always wanted to run that 308 because that's what I was running uh, for my job. So I I got doubled up on when I was going to shoot the PRS matches. I wasn't getting to shoot very much uh, at when I when I 
over those years of, of working, but the ones that I did, I was able to come back, go shoot the match, come back with, hey, guys, you never believe this, and this really works. This doesn't work because you're shooting in such unconventional positions oh, that yeah. you come back like, hey, let's let's try this, run it with your drill, with your platoon or, or you know, or whatever, and, and you're passing that knowledge on. And when you go instruct, you're able to do the same thing because it's, you know, everybody, oh, it's because a lot of the doctrine is, is so old, and the PRS has really brought that doctrine um, up to a, a very reputable standard. Um, and that's why I, I did it. And everybody said, you know, you transition early, transition early. I said, I can't, I, because the last thing I want is to go over uh, to bad guy land. And, uh, and I'm, I'm holding wins for a, a sixth grade more, which I shoot now. But um, <laughs> and, and, and you know, you're off of it. You're just completely off your game because you don't have the time really to run a, a, a win call to your head. Uh, when you can do your transition gun. So I was shooting exactly, I was loading 175s, I was shooting 175s, and we're shooting 175s military-wise for the Sierra. So it, it really, really helped out. It was actually training upon training off of my own dime, um, but it was training off of training after training and, and putting forth that effort and, and bringing back that knowledge. So it's the, the PRS style is just, is, is, is such, it's, it's been such a, a benefit there. I know so many, so many more every year. There's been another, you know, our goal um, is to bring more to the table, and, and you take them to that first match, and after that, they're they're and the guys that are doing our job are just hooked. Like yeah. they're just like, this is awesome, this is awesome. I'm shooting, I get to shoot 200 rounds at targets that you know are not 18 by 36 inches. You know, and you're shooting, <laughs> like, and, and and the thing that it does, it it, it humbles you mm, to no to, <laughs> to no no other end. It just it just brings you back down to where you thought, oh, I'm awesome, I'm awesome, and then and then you get out there, you're like, I need a lot of work. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. That, that's where um, the, my, I try pushing as many people I can military wise um, to to go do that and to get that opportunity to go out there and and because it really does tell you you need to you need to practice you need to train more and you need to train harder and and it just and the competitive side of it because a lot of the you know type A personalities so you want to win you you want to do well you want to beat the next guy and the nice thing is when you have a, a full and it's really kind of entertaining because you go to a match and they'll be like. 10 military guys there, and if they know each other, like we used to take um, back when with the platoon, we used to, no kidding, try our best to get as many as we could to a platoon. And then it turned into this giant, it, we had this out, a competition of 200 shooters, but then it rolled into like us 10 that were like, you know, just heckling each having other. Having your own contest. And, and having, <laughs> having our own internal uh, match. So it really brought up everyone's A game, and it kind of, but it really helped you what your weaknesses were and what you really needed to train on in order to. Uh, bring as many people back as you can from uh, overseas. So that's cool. It's 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 awesome. It's it's a it's an opportunity that I think everyone should try and just go do it. But it's that's awesome. cool. Yep. So as we now get into, you know, kind of going back to the reloading aspect of things and whatnot, as we get into loading up this ammunition, which, like we said, at this point in time, we've got the gear, but we don't actually we haven't started loading ammunition. We're, we're that'll be next. Where does one start? Like we said, chances are, unless you're like some super lucky person, or if you're just maybe, I don't know, loading exactly to factory specs or something like that. I, again, I don't even know fully all that information. But chances are the first bullet that you crank off that press isn't going to be the absolute best. It could be for your particular rifle, with your full setup, where you're shooting, all that. How do you, where do you even start? Is that, is that even a good question? Is that yeah, a good question? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, actually, so there's tons of reloading manuals out there, and almost every bullet manufacturer has a reloading manual. Every ammo manufacturer has reloading manuals. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite ones, um, and it's it's about uh, two and a half inches thick. It's uh, a Hornady. Their reloading manual is a hardcover book. It, it's really nice. got a lot of really good articles that in general, and then they also, I think the back, one-third of the book is just all calibers, bullets and then different charge weights different uh powders that you can be using um what the uh correct cartridge overall length does is. does it look like that that's the one right we've got there. one on our wall i got that one on my desk book is Mold. unbelievable Sweet. Um, what about pictures it's got pictures mark oh, yeah <laughs> yeah you're good man you're good you're good <laughs> so they have dvds too is, oh, the, is sure. the, <laughs> gotta love that. I mean, they do the reading for you. You just have to sit there, hey, sit crack there. a beer, watch. I don't think they have Kindle or anything to tell you. It's oh, a little sure. more hands on okay. and just sitting back and grabbing a margarita and reading. All right. And listening. Um, <laughs> just, all right. just there for you. Just so, looking out for you. Do most people start out by just kind of going with 
what the handbook tells them to do, and then and is it fine tuning from there? Or like Some, if you go online, you see people in the forums like, ah, I don't listen to that. You're gonna want to change this slightly. You're gonna want to change that slightly. What, what's there's going a on? lot of all of that. Yeah. First of all, <laughs> it's it's um, it's double edged. Yep. Okay. So here's the thing. Get with someone that you, one, trust that hasn't blown themselves up, and we'll get to that later. Yeah, I was uh, just going to say. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. Caveat on that later. Second, <laughs> um, get with people that run the same caliber and the same barrels and the same twist rates because that's hmm. th- what you yeah. have to focus on is what is my barrel length, what is my twist rate, and then what projectile. So if you start seeing a pattern, you know, I can right now, 6.5 Creedmoor, 130 grain, um, OTM or uh, 140 grain is going to take roughly 41.5 grains of H4350 or 42.5, depending on how fast you want to move. Hmm. There is there is this sweet spot for every caliber and cartridge out there. And as because somebody... Because it's already been done 100,000 right. times, especially 308, 260, 65 Creedmoor, my gosh. I mean, tons of information out go there. Go on to fate. I mean, yes. 308, 175 grain seer, Match it's like King. Doing an LS swap in a car. It's like everybody's yeah. putting an LS V8 yeah. into something. 45 grains of Varget. <laughs> it works great. <laughs> 44.5. Yeah, my, my load was 44.5. Okay. And then factory ammo. If you're running factory ammo, you don't need to worry about that because you're running open box, put in magazine, go chronograph. Yeah. What now, the, whatever the factory now, now you're speaking my language. Whatever yeah. the factory determined would work pretty good with a multitude of things. Well, that's so. one thing I was going to ask. Like in those reloading manuals, uh, which I should probably crack one at some point, Jim. Uh, are, is some of that information in there? Are they giving you that twist rate? Like, okay, this load. You know, here are the components, but this is what it works well with. Well, the no. companies, the manufacturers are giving you what they have tested with, and what okay. is good for liability in marketing. Okay. Correct. Telling you right now. So because you can't go sue them because they blew you up. Well, if you if the manual says, hey, f- because what they do in testing with their rifles might not actually be what you need to get or what you can get mm-hmm. optimally, safely in your mm-hmm. rifle. Correct. Because we're going to go down the rabbit hole here for a minute. You can, and I'll, I'll take the box ammo situation. Uh, I shot prime ammunition. Thank gosh they're coming back. Um, it was a good press release yesterday. It's a caveat on that. Oh, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I took a 200-round case of prime ammunition, went on four different rifles, four different chambered rifles, and the rifle off the left, rifle A, shot great. Single-digit ESs and SDs. What's, the rifle, uh, what's an after? ES? Okay, extreme a, spread extreme and standard, spread. standard deviation. We'll get, in, we'll get into that. It's chronograph okay. data. Okay, all right, all right. Um, but the rifle on the fair, the far right, number four rifle, had double digits and was not as accurate as the other rifles. That's that's the control you're giving up on factory ammunition is that you don't get to tailor it to your chamber. Okay. So you run the risk or the reward of having a rifle that can take that factory ammunition and run it great, or you're going to get it and your rifle just doesn't like it, and then you have to find another factory brand were those rifles all the same kind of rifle or were they different kinds but so like, different there was four different actions and four okay. different reamer specs. okay because i've even heard sometimes where there's just minor differences if both guys are running a ruger american for example we use those all the time around here because they're cheap and they shoot good but yep. if, and they it, can be it, running the same kind of gun and they'll sh- act differently it, down to the chamber and the reamer specs that can all can affect because if you have the same ammunition in the same box there's a lot there's a tolerance in there and mm-hmm. it's going to be pretty somewhat tight. Yeah. It's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And again, you're giving up that control off of factory ammo. And that's why a lot of competitors like to do the reloads because they control those tolerances, bring it down to the best optimal charge weight, seating depth, and everything so their rifle runs the best way. Okay. okay. I mean, I guess you think of a custom rifle, right? Custom built to your specs, things you like, how you want it to work. It's rather custom than, ammo. Uh, yeah. Rather than built to the whole world specs. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. So, does that? I, now I'm even trying to remember back. Did we? Did we determine that the? You start out. Oh, that's right. So you got to find somebody else who's got, or other people, or a group of other people who are running something similar to you are. So at least, like you said, barrel length, twist rate, that kind of thing. Once you find them, you you'll hopefully at that point have 
a decent starting ground. Mm -hmm. Are most of those people, are you looking for them on forums? Are you looking for them on, like, where's the best place you Uh, find these guys? In the the PRS (laughs) realm, NRL realm, and that, in that circle or that, that sphere, as I call it, Mm -hmm. we're, we're all pretty much connected. So when someone's running a 105 grain projectile and a six Creed more, guarantee there's about 10 other people that's running the same barrel, same projectile, same charge weight. And it's like, Hey, I'm getting this. Hey, I'm getting this. Another way you can go about it, and it's mostly because I taught myself how to handle it, and I had nobody really to bounce stuff off of besides my old man. He was learning at the same time as me. Um, grabbing one of those books, and uh, you, you, they, they'll tell you what uh, they find to be a good load, and you can kind of start from there. Um, one technique I, I always used, um, and this is when I first started, was I would look at that load, and then I would load up and down two tenths in every direction as far mm-hmm. as weight goes. And then I can find an accuracy node from that because my accuracy node might not be perfectly at that spot, but it's probably going to be somewhat near it. Two tenths, is that is that as far as your powder charge? Or two tenths that? of a grain. Okay. So we'll get into that because I know you guys will probably have questions on how to validate what comes off the reloading bench. Yep. Yeah. Because that comes into the chronograph side of it. You have to qualify and quantify what you do off the reloading bench. Without a chronograph and without any type of way to validate what your your how your rifle and your ammunition are going to perform practically and statistically, you're... It's like taking a ship without any type of navigation and saying, going <laughs> steaming right towards, towards Niagara Fall. You're going to go off the cliff here soon. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Noted. Yep. Tony, out of curiosity, real quick, this is somewhat off topic. We'll get mm-hmm. back on topic. But when you're shooting, um, the stuff, like when you when you go overseas, when guys go overseas mm-hmm. and they are, again, professional marksmen mm-hmm. using products overseas, they're not reloading their own ammunition, oh, right? Not. You're using stuff that you're given. If you come back and you're practicing, mm-hmm. do you find it then advantageous for you to practice with whatever you're going to be given, or do you still reload when you come back and you're in the civilian world and doing those kind of competitions? So what I did is I reloaded to my ammunition specs, speeds and all that. Um, so I load up the ammunition. I was fortunate enough. Uh, I, I had a, a gentleman that built my first gun, um, uh, he was kind of really good, and he was big into 175s because he did a lot of uh, military work. Um, so he, I was very lucky to learn that process. So he was able to give me the same thing you're just talking about. He gave me the recipe. Mm. He says, if you want to, sh- if you want to make your ammunition exactly the same stuff that you're shooting overseas, do A, B, C, and D, and it'll shoot the same. And I was like, there's no way. And he's like, shoot out of this gun, and like, it'll it'll be the same. And sure, sure enough, it was. It, it shot. It was accurate. I I literally loaded it up. And the nice thing about the 175 and Ryan will say the same thing is that it's so forgiving. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of them bullets that I, I've told people before. Is like if your gun can't shoot 175 Sierra bullets, there's something wrong with the gun. 100. <laughs> uh, it, it's so true it, too. It, 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 they 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 shoot on so, so you can you can. Uh, it's it's crazy on, on on how how easy they are to load. And and sure enough, I never changed the recipe from. It was 40. I was running 4064 at the time, and. Uh, went home and I'm like, all right, you know, whatever, got into it and asked him, I'm on the phone with him a lot of times, asking the same questions that, that, uh, you know, just starting off loading, you know, uh, hand loading. I did it when I was younger, but, uh, that was basically off of Dylan from a, a friend of mine. But, uh, yeah, he was, well, he came, went back there and I was on the phone with him. I'm like, Hey, what do I do here? And what do I do here? And what do I do here? And luckily enough, he was just like, yeah, just do this, 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 and this, and this. I'm like, okay. And sure enough, I took it out there and I'm like, wow, this gun shoots phenomenal. You huh, know? It's pretty and, slick, and, and so I was I was very fortunate. I didn't have to go through the whole process of making it accurate. I just had a guy say, "Hey, just like Ryan said earlier, you know, a lot of times that you're very we're very fortunate. You can call up a guy and say, "Hey, do this, 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 and this. Make your overall length this, and take it out, and like it runs. Like even to the point now where you, you run like barrels. And Ryan said, uh, you, you know, you, you shoot a barrel, and a lot of times right now, I just know I just run mine up to a certain muzzle velocity, and it shoots." perfect every time once you find that mine mine loves to run uh 29 uh 29 50 feet a second and it shoots each, at first i'm like no it's not possible and i mean i have to adjust powder my powder charge to get that mm-hmm. um basing it off of um uh, if i change out powder um from a new jug if i if i crack open another eight pounds of powder um and normally i gotta i get there's a little factor of that one of, of i was out in north carolina and, and the humidity uh, would destroy powder, and after a while, oh. I didn't know. Coming from California, I got to North, uh, North Carolina, and sure enough, you know, out in California, you can you can leave your powder in a hopper overnight. You can leave it in there for days, and there's no issues. I did that once. 
<laughs> in North Carolina with, with in my uh, in my auto uh, my auto trickler. Kept kept it in there and and uh, all of a sudden I went to the you know load up some loads and I'm like, gosh, these things are going really really slow as my barrel shot out and I'm like, there's no way, fifty percent, there's water. no way. Sure enough, <laughs> it, 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 it was crazy. I mean, it, it, I dropped muzzle velocity like my barrel was gone and I was like, how is this possible? I'm only at I think I was at 900 rounds on this gun and sure enough, I went back threw powder back into into the trickler. And, you know, I talked to somebody, and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, and they're like, you can't do that out here. You know, out there, you have to load. And I did it in, the, in the, my garage is where I had to do it. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, the humidity out there is just so ridiculous that if I had to either load in the morning where there was none or late, late, late at night. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. For, huh. the, for, the, for the powder not to get saturated, I'll if I call it that, that way. My kestrel, so, comes, yeah. my kestrel comes out inside, and I, I make sure the humidity is not up inside the house. Oh, you? Oh, wow. Yep. You're going and, full on, but even I in your house. just to make sure. But I don't like once I'm done reloading, I dump all the powder out of the the trickler, the hopper, and everything's back into the jug and mm-hmm. sealed up. Okay, yeah. okay. so okay. You're, you're, you can put it back in, then no problem. Yeah, yes. yeah. 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 I don't, I don't leave it out. There's well, one time I did leave it out, and that was because well, it was like two in the morning, and I had to get up for work three hours in three hours. So I'm like, oh, I'm not dumping all this out just to put it back in when I get back home. So right. I just leave it sit there. And then do you ever get in a scenario where you've been maybe loading multiple things with different types of powder and then you might not want to put that powder back into the original container or for like cross contamination? No. No. Uh, no. 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 You, you, if I switch from H4350 to Varget to IMR 4064, I am making sure that everything is cleaned out. Okay. Yep. You don't want to yep. mix it. If there is any chance that I have mixed powder, it goes into a jug that reads "burn later" because yep. I'm not. It's a fire use starter. It. It's a. F- yeah. <laughs> I make fireworks in the backyard off of a rock <laughs> and have a fire extinguisher next hand by. I'm in Texas. Sometimes it gets really dry, and I can't do that. <laughs> right, that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking up now. Uh, I'm I'm looking up the gun that I'm going to be shooting. And Mark, I, I don't know exactly the specs on the gun you're going to be shooting, but I, I'm I'm starting to wonder now. Nick, you mentioned, for example, doing a factory load, and then you're you're changing some of the powder charge by what was it two tenths or something like that so when you get going. What I, what I'm actually doing is looking at the book data, and yeah. in the book data, what they'll do is they'll give you a high charge weight and a low charge weight based on the recommendations, and then they'll also tell you what they consider to be an optimal charge weight. Okay. And that optimal charge weight is usually where I like to start off because I know that somebody's already tested it, they got a pretty good idea, and then from there I'll go two tenths, two tenths, two tenths going up, and then also go in the downward direction direction to to find my node and essentially match that load to the harmonics of my barrel. Are you loading up like 10 of each, 20 of each, 5 of each? How many how many car- like cartridges total are you loading up of each one of those? It combos? does depend on the type of load development you're doing. So for me, um, wasn't very, I guess a, a couple of years back, I think now I was watching a video um, and Scott Satterley was talking about a type of load development he does. And it's basically 100% based on um, finding a velocity node. And in the way... The way I started loading from that was I would actually only do two uh, two rounds at each of these powder weights. Oh, just two rounds. Okay. Yep, I would do two rounds. And then you can actually plot them out on the graph and you can add on. So Is the, your gun al- – I sorry to interrupt you. Is yeah. your gun already sighted in though? So that way – it's it's gonna be in the ballpark, so I'm on paper. So you're on, but it doesn't ball- really need to be. It, it doesn't really right. matter. All no, you need to do because is if you're doing your group it, is. yep, okay, yeah, because I'm not I'm not really caring what the group is. Because if you're shooting in a really good velocity node, the chances are you're gonna be shooting a pretty good group too. And if you really want to fine tune that group, you can then adjust your seating depth a little bit in and out, and uh, go back and 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 verify that you're still in that same velocity node. But it, once you find a, a large velocity node, the benefit of that is especially if you're using fairly temperature-stable powder and, and good quality equipment and, and you, you, you have consistency across the board as you're reloading, um, you can take it out in so many different conditions, and if that node is large enough, you're, you're fine. The um, node large enough meaning that you've... What does that mean? How, how so is if, if you large... I have a, I post on Instagram like I don't know, maybe a year ago I did one and I actually plotted it out on a graph I had two different graphs one showing the the velocity and it had one line for the high velocity one line for the low velocity and one line for the um, uh, for the average and that is just a line graph and you can see that it'll It'll open big, little, big, little, and then all of a sudden you'll see where they kind of converge together and they'll just hang 
close and then it'll open back up. And where oh, they all okay. hang together, that's a, a velocity node. And you can look at where you are on that graph. In this case, I was between 40, I believe it was 41.9 and uh, 42.5. Basically, if I cut it right in half, I can screw up my powder charge up a little bit or down a little bit, or the, the ambient temperature can change pretty dramatically outside, and that would increase my velocity or decrease my velocity, but still, I would remain in that node. So hmm. that was a very consistent load. Interesting. The, the way that I actually had that particular one set up, um, it, that out of that rifle, I was shooting... Um, I was shooting just short of um, a quarter minute at 200 yards very consistently, and then... Uh, my standard deviation was at around two, two, two feet per second. So wow. is the biggest thing you want to get consistent right off the bat velocity more so than your group? Okay. Or is... Or your powder charge? This is the, this is the part okay. where uh, Magneto Speed um, customer service so guy comes into play. <laughs> here, here's, here's my opinion, and this is based off of everyone I've talked to. Every, you want to reload for accuracy. Okay. Because you could have fast velocity, but if your accuracy and your precision, and just say accuracy and precision are two separate things. Interesting. They are. Um, you can have an accurate rifle, but not precise. You can have a precise rifle and not accurate. You want a precise and accurate rifle. Can you, like, Please is there like a, elaborate. Like a 30 <laughs> I'm going to have to send you a, a chart that's going because you can have a precise. Uh, precise and accurate means wherever your point of aim and point of impact is, it's a tight group. Okay. You can have an accurate rifle, but not precise, meaning your group is really tight, but it's not precise to your point of aim. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. Okay. Right. So they're mutually together, but they're separate. Right. So those two the, terms. Okay. And the opposite. There's so, actually a book that you guys would probably enjoy. It's uh, it's um, a Ryan Litt's book. It's Applied Ballistics. Yep. And they talk about the weapon employment zone analysis. And uh, the WES analysis is really good for determining what distance or what factors you can utilize that weapon system in. Um, so if you can use the factor of the shooter being a factor, the conditions being a factor, the rifle's accuracy being a factor, um, the consistency of the ammunition being a factor, all those factors across the board, um, there's actually even a program that's really handy. It'll show the group size at given ranges, and by the size of your target, it'll tell you the weapon employment zone for that particular weapon system. It's really hmm. handy, but it Whoa. does break down the difference between accuracy yeah, and precision really well. Okay. You're going into the rabbit hole when using the, the WES. You yeah, do. It sounds yeah, like rabbit it. hole. So sounds like we're going to come back to surface on... So we, you guys talked about and asked about, you know, different methods. Um, the, three, the three major methods to finding your what your rifle is doing with that ammunition as it comes off the bench. Velocity ladder, or, you know, what's got Satterley, what Nick mentioned, Satterley. And that's, you're, you're not doing any type of grouping or zeroing. You're just seeing where that velocity ladder is from your low charge all the way up to your high charge. Oh, okay. Seeing where it flattens out. Method to do that is 10 to 12 rounds, 0.1 grain increments all the way up. And you can do as many tests. Oh, oh you only so need what you're shoot, saying is... You only need to shoot one or two rounds at each powder charge. Exactly, and yeah. just and just with a chronograph with on, a chronograph on, you're seeing you're seeing the 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 velocity elevate up, and what you're looking for is a flat spot. Yeah, so it'll go like this, and two or three, and then, yeah, so like three you may charge have gone, weights flatten out. Yeah, interesting. That's your velocity. You know, that's how a velocity ladder. That should get you started. Okay, because. In this day and age, bullets are expensive, powder is expensive, components are expensive. You don't want to waste a lot. Yeah. I get mm -hmm. that. Everyone wants to get their stuff done. Barrels with, are expensive. Yeah, barrels are expensive <laughs> too. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, six Creedmoor boy over there too. <laughs> yeah. Six XE, six Creedmoor, six five. They're all expensive. Uh, OCW, which is optimal charge weight. Yeah. Um, someone who kind of knew, I think it was Dan Newberry. Dan Newberry, yep. yep. Newberry OCW test. So, an optimal charge weight test is now that you've found your your low charge weight, high charge weight, and you're you're trying to find out what's the most accurate, what your rifle likes to group. Um, caveat to this is anytime you get on the gun, you're introducing us, the human. Yes. That can screw it up or can make it shine. So just remember that. OCW is a grouping test. Okay. All right. For this, and this is where it comes into our chronograph, um, it can be done with a chronograph on or with a chronograph off. 
Now, magneto speed, the biggest thing we got going our, with ours is a lot of people say it has POI shift, point of impact shift. When you're doing an OCW test, you don't want to be exactly on your point of aim because you need to focus or your point, your, your point of aim. You want to you have the group slightly off because you want to focus on that point of aim and not what your group's doing. Oh, okay, okay. I get it. So how that works is three rounds of the same charge weight, two groups of them. So six rounds total for that charge weight. Okay. You fire two three-round groups, and you do that for your four or five different charge weights that are separated maybe by two-tenths of a grain. Okay, and still all within that first velocity node that you found? Is this something you're doing after that? This is after that. Okay, You're so just you've... validating the groups now. You already found yeah. a velocity node. Now you're trying to see... Now, you're getting into, now we're getting into the weeds of seating depth and charge weight. Okay, so okay. we're talking about charge weight now. So we're we're taking out the ones where there was that flat spot and across exactly. the velocity thing. And, so and this we're is test those now for the group. This is just us narrowing it down further after you find your node. You can okay. you know, if you just load in the center of your accuracy or your your velocity node, there's a good chance you're you're, you're probably gonna be fine as it is. But then doing the OCW uh, test and actually finding which spot based on the uh, slight changes in your charge weight and your seating depth, that's where you get that mm-hmm. that ammunition that is literally perfect for your rifle. Okay. Correct. So once you have that data and you start measuring your groups, you find out, okay, you know, 40, uh, 39.8, that was a really accurate group, really tight, sub half MOA. It's like 0. 0.440. That's cool. Awesome. And 41 or 40.5 wasn't so accurate. That was a little too fast. So once you find your, your – and this is – now I'm going to get into – especially PRS shooting and being out in the environmentals, you have to pick a slow or low charge weight and a high, hot charge weight. Here's the reason why. We're going to be going out and shooting. You're going to be shooting in Wyoming, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the weather always nice, sunny, with no rain? No. No. Okay. (laughs) So what happens when you get water inside your chamber or inside the bore? Oh, uh, stuff that... (laughs) <laughs> okay. Yeah, Brian that's fair because water is a yep. water is a solid thing. It'll create a hydraulic seal essentially. It'll, and yeah, okay. you, get, you get an increase. impression that increase. Makes sense. So if you run a hot charge weight and you go down to Altus or a match where it rains and you're just getting dumped on monsoon style and you start blowing primers because you ran a hot charge weight for a wet chamber. You oh, have so you to do really a water test. Bump that pressure up. Yes. And that, and water can do that. What about like dust? Because it's really it's really dusty out at the at the extreme. So dust, do? not it have to be a lot. Here's the okay. reason: I went to New, shot New Mexico matches a lot, and out there it's like moon dust, okay, it's yeah, talcum right. powder. Yeah, did not in the, the three years that I shot the New Mexico match, and I ran a fairly hot charge weight for that those matches in Six Creedmoor. I didn't have issues out there running running that match. Hmm. It's when it got wet, it rained. Interesting. So, you have to take your low charge weight and your high charge weight. And when you test your low charge weight and water test it and it still has pr- pressure issues, signs of pressure on the primer or extract- extractor swipes on the back of the case, you need to bring your charge weight down. Because if you go to a match, you've spent the money to fly, get a rental car, hotel, food, load all your components, and then you go and you start blowing primers, it's like... It's like, yeah. get, it's, like wanna, it's like I, you didn't it's like looking for the Red Rider BB gun for Christmas and you didn't get the Red Rider. Exactly. You're a little disappointed. Uh, I don't want to have beeps. <laughs> Going to shoot a match and they have <laughs> issues with your load and you have to sit out there with a the file all day would be pretty frustrating. Yeah, I remember. I, I know, yeah, I remember. <laughs> wow. So, um, for for wow. Uh, <laughs> wow, you just went a little you, you went, you went right one. there. Right right there, man. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so it is frustrating that if right. if you if you get into that situation and you're like and I've seen seasoned shooters that want to get that 3000 that 3050 velocity and then all of a sudden it's a just straight rain dump and they're blowing primers. When you blow a primer, what exactly happens? It sounds to me like the primer just blasts out the back of the case, and then yep, you got. That's it. That's and then it. Is is the case just stuck at that point somehow, or is it that that's just not good for 
I know it's not good, but what is it? What does it do? There's a lot of things that can happen. Uh, these guys, are yeah. Probably... Um, so depending on how your rifle's set up, you can get that blown primer can come out and get stuck in your trigger group, or mm-hmm. it could just fall out, oh, okay. or it could get. Next thing you know, you're 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 trying to grind down your bolt camming down. It's because a primer's stuck in your your lug recesses, and now you're galling everything up in there. So you you just don't want it. Now that's fair. Extractor swipes is like the first telltale sign. And I'll live with having some extractor swipes just because of something might happen. But when I start seeing blown primers and, and just feeling heavy recoil on the gun, sticky bolt, yeah. bolt being, you know, you can't bring the bolt Cratering up. Cratering on the primer. Yeah. yeah. That's another one. That's, that, I know I'm running too too hot. Like okay. what's happening that's creating an extractor? I mean, I know you've got, you know, a little that's a little bit too hot or too much pressure, right? But the extractor swipe is indicating that what has happened. So all that, that bolts forward and there's a headspace. And um, you correct me if I get on the technical terms. I know Jim C was here. He was like, this is what happens. You give you the whole <laughs> No, rundown. Brian, no. No, no. <laughs> We'd have a few more, what we've had a few more bleeps to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> um that that pressure is just pushing that case on the back of the, uh, on that bolt face, okay. and it's not giving enough clearance to get out of the chamber. So now you're expanding the chamber obturation of the case against the case walls, and the neck tension. It's all out of whack. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Okay. All right. Oh, I imagine that probably d- would affect whether you do or don't want to reload that case. Then perhaps you or could not? go back and reload yeah. that case. Fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it, I I never. If I have an issue with a case. I never, I get rid of the case because it's my thing is, I don't know. It's, and the thing is, a lot of people that are uh, reloaders are like, they're superstitious as, <laughs> as, can, as can get all out. Oh, yeah. Like, there's, oh, yeah. <laughs> once they do it once and they got, a, they got a great load, they'll do it even if it doesn't help, like clean and prior pockets. Like, if, if a, you have a guy that cleans prior pockets every single time he reloads, he'll continue to do it if he has great results. But then the one time that he doesn't have the time, to do it, and he gets the same results. He stops cleaning primer pockets. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, it so just takes that one it, time to it, break it. Yeah, yeah. But they're very. I'm, I'm super. Or, I'm the same way. I'll re, I'll sit in my I'll set my garage and I'll load. If I need two hundred and twenty, if I need two hundred twenty rounds for a match, I'll load one hundred and ten in one at one go, and then I'll same whole setup. I will not stop. I will not quit and end there until I have one hundred and ten of them loaded. Then I'll go out again the next time, and I'll load the next 110. I will not do 25, 25, 25, or I'll load them all at one go if I have the time. But I will, if I don't have the time, I start late and I need that need that ammunition. I will I will load them like in lots if you want to call it the same way. It's the sure. best way of saying it. And I didn't do it one time this year. I had a lot loaded, went out and loaded. Uh, I needed. I think I shot some of them and went back out and. I did not have the same results with the second lot. And again, it's probably because of the humidity piece where I was was doing it. And I'm like, no, I'll just get it. All I need is 50. All I need is 50. And I went out there and loaded them. And I, knowing I shouldn't have uh, in that humidity, <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't good. I, could, I, could, I knew exactly which ones that I had. And, and uh, But yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all relevant of, of, of what you believe in and, what, and um, what, what you get good results with. And once you get what good results, it's, it's hard to drag anyone off yeah. from, from doing it that way. Yeah, I, I'm an overachiever. I sit there and, and snort mainline five hour <laughs> energy and go through 345 in one sitting. Woo. So when I'm off the reloading bench, you know, my wife's like, "You okay?" I'm like, "I'm fine, honey. I'm, I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, better fine. than fine. Ready to go run a marathon, especially after priming." <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can't do it. Yeah, once you once you prime about 200 rounds in a row, and you get that priming tool, you, you, you don't know what a hand cramp is until you do that. God, you guys just keep talking me into it. Um, <laughs> Tell you what, never been more excited for just about anything in my life. Mm. When you are, when you load, I guess, different, you know, lots, batches, whatever we want to call these things, do you still, do you try to keep them, do you mark them and try and keep them separate? No. No. I, when I, I literally, I've got. I mean, not the individual cartridge, but I mean, like, here's this box of 110 or whatever, this lot of 110, and I, this date, these conditions, that, and then. I did this box. Superstition. <laughs> and it is. It's a superstition. superstition. Like, like I'll, I'll, I do. And I have no. masking tape that I put on top, and I, and I wrote down, you know, uh, load, uh, what's in them. Because after a while, if you start running them and you have to change barrels and you don't, and then you kind of forget, and then you just turn that ammo 
that you didn't trust into practice ammo, you know, whatever for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, that didn't shoot as well. You don't want to get rid of it, and you don't want to pull bullets because then it just whatever. Yeah. You just they, they don't shoot as good as they should, but they're still a good bullet. But yeah, hundred percent. Uh, like I'll I'll mark them. I've had to do it recently where I had to load up eight hundred rounds. So I I literally was I put them in you know my fifty round boxes and I and I marked them all and now now they're sitting in lots of you know one box one box two all my all my boxes have one two that one two three four five six on a fifty and uh, and all my all my bins have got um, and and the thing is too like I just said earlier it's it's, <laughs> it's because at the end of the day for mm-hmm. me it's it is uh, just like SDs you don't need to have single digit SDs you don't. But and I know Jim and then Jim C was talking about that as well, and I, I agree 100. percent But I can have them, and if I but if I do find a load that I run in single digit SDs and my ESs are are really good, I have confidence that no matter what I'm doing, that round's gonna if I'm doing what I'm doing, the gun's gonna perform well. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's to me it's not you don't need them, but it's a confidence thing. You can you can make shots that because you're like oh this this ammo's shooting great and half it's mental. You know, mm-hmm. not, not 80 per, 90% of it's probably mental of, of knowing that if I put the crosshairs and I put that dot on my, in my sev, in my seven C and say, I'm going to hit where that dot's going, you know, and when you're able to bring the gun over and, and to come over a half a 10th, like you can do on it. Um, mm. that's a nice aspect about it. when you're like, ah, oh, I'm shooting a really good group, but I, I've got five shots the size of a dime. And, but I can, if I bring it a half a 10th left, I can be center. And you're like, and you don't need to go over half a no. ten, <laughs> but I, but I find myself still doing it because it's a confidence thing of knowing that where that dot was is where all the bullets went. Um, so I'll caveat that. that I think that's, that's I think Dave that. Dave Preston, who we're going to shoot with this weekend, and he's coming up for the match, uh, the Wisconsin Barrel Maker Classic. I think he actually is he he zeroes his gun in at a half a tenth mil to the right. And I, I recall him saying that that he he actually prefers being somewhat off to the right or the left by a half of a tenth. Was Jeez. it just because of position oh, okay. and and whatever? I I'm gonna ask Dave about it. I'm gonna quiz him. Yeah, this like when on he's all stuff. calm and collected at the range for whatever reason, it's very slightly different than when he's in the in the heat of things. Oh, I can yeah. see that. So I, I remember that's just just caving on what you said. I mean, for. I think at this point, for the listeners, um, we need to get into some terms. We're we're, we're bouncing around acronyms. That is and, true. Yeah, yep. we, yeah we we're bouncing around some acronyms here. You said okay. yes. We go, I know we yes. talked about SDs, which is the uh, standard, standard deviation. deviation. Standard deviation. So um, yeah. All right. So uh, any chronograph on the market now is going to give you um, some some basic information. You're going to get, and I'm going to bust out some math terms here. Uh, ES is a, basically a shooter term. The actual mathematical term is range. You have a high point and you have a low point. Okay. So the range of your data in your sample, because we're doing sampling here. So um, for all you statistics nerds, you're probably going to be like, yes, this is awesome. So um, <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot. <laughs> Guilty. I remember a statistics class. <laughs> I took one, but I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm not even sure if I took one. I, rec- <laughs> I recall that I was there. So range is extreme spread. So you have your your maximum velocity and your minimum velocity okay. for your high data point or your low data point. All right. So your extreme spread or the range is the difference between those two points. All right. Speaking okay. velocities. Speaking velocities. Okay. So your highest velocity and your lowest velocity in the sample. Okay. That's that's extreme spread. Now, from that, depending on how many shots you have in there, you're going to get an average. And the mm-hmm. average muzzle velocity is, out of all the data there is, that is the one variable or one statistical portion that goes out of your chronograph and goes into your ballistic solution. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your ES, your SD, your extreme spread does not go into any solution, any commercial solution there is. Okay. All right. There's some other solutions that it, that it can go into, but... For commercial, for the basic shooter, basically for military competition law enforcement, the only one that matters is your average muzzle velocity. Yeah, that's a huge one. That we've, that, we've that's the only about. one that you extrapolate. Those three, four, or whatever your program you're doing, those digits go into your solution, and that's what the, that's what the algorithm needs to take. All right. So that's the big one. Now, and that's not discounting that ES and SD and standard deviation – now the math, the math nerds are going to be like, okay, standard deviation. There's two different types: population and sample. 
We're not doing oh, population. Shoot, I remember. This, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> it's all right, Mark. It's, the statistics Sorry. can't hurt Needs you. Need some now. water? <laughs> it's all right. It can't hurt you. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this from like deep rabbit hole up to surface show, level. Show us on the cube where the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Hurt you? So <laughs> you're we'll the, the two numbers that you you have to focus on, and a lot of people and there there's been debate, and I mean even at at work. We have the consensus that you want to focus on your SD. ES is important, but S, your standard deviation is, is the number you want to look at. So sample standard deviation. You have your average. That deviation is the deviation of all of your data from the average. So you can have right. an ES and you can have outliers. Mm-hmm. Outliers say like, you know, your charge master, your auto trickler dumped a, a, a few extra... Trump. grains in and you didn't catch it or your seating depth was a tenth off or a hundredth off or whatever and you have one that's really fast and one that's really slow but like the other 12 or 13 or 14 whatever's in your sample are right there at like a at a 5 sd okay because i've seen an es of 30 with an sd of five and hmm. that's because you have an outlier high and an outlier low and you're just disregarding those outliers then are they coming into this final number so here's the funny thing a lot of people throw up all the 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 five or ten round groups on the magneto speed or the lab radar or whatever chronograph they're using and it's like the lowest es and sd and there's delete functions and features on every commercial chronograph well, well, yeah, that's, and for, it, that's for Instagram. And I got it. You <laughs> yeah. need your likes you and your, your there. got it. Do so it that I can get um, sponsored and get followers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why you? Man, come on. You're not supposed to tell our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> they um, should just, they should, it should just be a, the I, it should, IG function. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I hit the IG. I, IG, IG, IG asterisk. When you delete something off the the, the, the magneto speed, there's a little asterisk yeah. that comes up. Been deleted for IG. Yeah. yeah. We were, you know, oh. we thought about doing that. There's a beautiful hashtag that should be coming up for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on that. Um, if I know I have an outlier, either low or high, and I mean, I am positive, 100% positive, it's an outlier. And it's nowhere near my higher low charge weight or what I'm supposed to be seeing. I'll delete it. Okay. I will delete it. Now, it doesn't I, seem like it's helping you. You know what I mean? Well, here's the risk you run. What happens if you did load a bunch like that and now that's Fair in your enough. batch? So that's the, on the statistical side, the bigger your sample, Right. Of your of your population, the higher your confidence interval. Now, there's something I want to add to that is that if you're seeing those outliers and you're maybe you go ahead and do the test again, you see a very similar set of outliers. Um, that actually could be a sign. Um, it could be a sign that your charge is extremely sensitive to something like seating depth, mm-hmm. or um, uh, a slight variance in neck tension, or the case wall thickness is changing something. Um, hmm. So if you're seeing those jumps, the other thing you can do and and something I like to do if I'm doing low development is if I see some odd inconsistency, if I get like a a set of 10 and I'm getting one, a a flyer or something just odd that the shot felt perfect and the stars didn't align right, I'll make a mark on the case. And and I'll pay attention to it. If, If I come back and I do another... Another set, and uh, I fire a shot, and something goofy happens again, and I eject the case, and I look at it, and it's got that mark on it. That case is going in the garbage. Okay, um, sure. Because there's something not, uh, there's not something not right, and it usually comes down to just a basic inconsistency somewhere that I'm not seeing, but it's enough for me to. Well, that case costs a yeah. dollar. I'm throwing in the garbage. I've done the same thing with arrows before. You know, you yep. find you're like, okay, mark your fletchings. Yep. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So on. This is where I separate the practical versus the statistical because um, the best shooter, five, ten rounds, they go true, they get their average velocity and they go true out the distance on train up day or at their home range and then they're hitting out up to 1500. Okay, great. They're done. That's the practical side of it with five rounds off of a chronograph. Okay. Statistically, you, that data is insignificant. So if you take a batch of 400 rounds and you only do four or five, your confidence inter- interval is just nothing. It, it's shot. It's yeah. low. So statistically, you want a large sample. And that's what the chronograph... And going back to SD, we do sample SD. So math nerds, that's the N-1 formula. Just to, just anyone following. 
Noted. And everyone's looking at each other like, okay. You know what? All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into the weeds too much on that one. Anybody? So. Anybody following? <laughs> <laughs> anybody following out there? All right. So you have your your <laughs> cricket crickets. <laughs> you have your extreme spread. You have your minimum, your maximum, your average, your ES, and your SD. So okay, yeah. that's the data that comes off the chronograph. So when you get done with your batch and your ammunition and you're doing low development, you start looking at this data and you want to start processing it. What's my average velocity for this, for this test? What are my ES and SD? Yep. That, those three numbers right there, that's your qualifying and quantifying variables. Your ES, your SD, and your average velocity. Okay. We need those things. You need those three things. The one you really need for any algorithm for applied ballistics, Ford off, more than anything else, is your average velocity. Right. Right. Yep. right. And then and so this this comes, we've done I'm I know I'm rehashing something, I'm probably already rehashed, but we've done the velocity thing. We've we've figured the uh the, the ladder. Velocity the, ladder. The velocity ladder. After that, that was where we figured our it was ideal charge weight or something. Optimal, optimal charge, charge weight. Optimal charge weight. Okay. And is and it, doing that OCW thing is that what's got us to this last point that we were just discussing? The the optimal charge weight helped us figure out. Well, I guess it helped us figure out the optimal charge weight. But then we that, got that and then tested to see what our ES and SD and well. So now, okay, in the in the in the order of things, you've done your OCW and there was one other test and that's a traditional ladder test and you do that out the distance, um, and that's shooting at a target with a water line spray painted or a target with a water line designed in it. And water line oh, right. is a, a horizontal line to see your vertical dispersion. And mm -hmm. if you're putting targets on that water line consistently or consistently low or consistently high that could be as long as it's consistent but what you really want is all your rounds being along that that water line because okay. that shows very little vertical dispersion um one of the guys that does it religiously is Derek Love out of Kansas and he does it in, in preparation for the king of two mile he was doing water line tests out to 800 900 yards they do it in Texas and I've even done it a couple times. Have a target out there that's fairly wide, get the waterline spray painted, and uh, Frank Galley has actually steel targets with steel water lines on it so mm -hmm. that he can see where the impacts are on that. And the reason, because a vertical dispersion is worse than a horizontal dispersion? Horizontal is your wind. Yeah. The horizontal is going to be just side to side, right? You know, that's 100% based on wind. I wind mean, is always going to happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you have Gravity very little, only works one way and one negative. Your variable one from the ammunition, and where this is where extreme spread comes in. Extreme spread translates to vertical dispersion. So if you have a very large ES, that could mean you have a very large vertical dispersion. Yeah. For Pierre, and this is what Tony said, and this is, you know, Jim and Regina is, you know, double digit. ES is, there's people who have gone to match. Regina's told me multiple times, yeah, ES was 25, and she went and won a match, a national-level match with an ES of 25. Meanwhile, you have people sweating over an ES of 10, and they're not getting their dry fire practice. It's, like, it's yeah. like one of those things when you watch a football player, and they're like, oh, this guy you know, won the Heisman, but he had a stress fracture all season. It's like, can you believe they won a match with a double-digit ES? People are, <laughs> people are fainting, going weak at the knees, yeah. collapsing. I like, can't believe I mean, it. I'll take, I'll take a 20, 25 ES and a 10 SD to a match any day. In fact, I have. Give it 308. And there's people that have won matches, club level and and done top fifteen hmm. na nationally, with double digits. Very um, interesting. I guess so. And what what's creating this vertical dispersion though? Like let's say like we've we've developed this load. Different velocities. Different velocities. Okay. Faster rounds are going to go higher, in your in the trajectory in the arc because they're flying flatter. Slower rounds are going to have more of. Yeah, because if, okay. if you're expecting the bullet's arc to do. A thing, and so you you used your reticle and things like that to essentially arc your handheld cannon that you have in such a way that it will end up right on that sure. horizontal line at one certain spot. But then it goes faster than you anticipated. It won't dip as much or won't arc as much. But then it goes no. slower than you anticipated. It'll drop yeah, down more no, I totally follow that, and I guess that's where I was going. Like I was making, I guess you know, an assumption, and maybe we're just creating an example. Like I thought we had developed a load where it's like okay. 
like our velocity oh, node so is we, like super tight. Yeah. So then yes. I was like, well, all, well, what the heck is? I was like, I thought we solved this problem already. Uh, you already so, have. Yeah. You're right. Good you point. have solved. You have solved the problem. But in case you, during this whole process, and then you haven't solved it, and you get to shooting down range, gotcha. you see on a you know thirty by thirty target at at, at fifteen hundred yards, and you're seeing hits at the top and at the very bottom. Mm-hmm. You have a very wide. Yes. I'll use that for yeah. if I have two loads that I, I just feel like are great and I just don't know which one to go with, put a target out at five, 600 yards, put that vertical line on there, and shoot a group at both of them, at one target with one load and another target with the other, and whichever one has the lowest vertical dispersion is probably going What's your method, with. Tony? For... I do downrange I, I, verification. Ba- basically, what, what, just what Nick said, you know, put the horizontal line, uh, you know, put your target on. And if I got ones, I, and you're always that that's the thing. Nick hit uh, hit it perfect. Like I think you're when you're shooting your groups at a hundred, and you have your your tight group, and you have two tight groups, you're you're always going to have these two that are that are falling in that no, in that actually node that are just going to be really tight. You're like, oh, which one? Which one? Which one should I use? Which one should I use? That's where you literally go down there, take that, and figure hmm. out what your and even if they marry up, the the funny thing is I've noticed it over the time. Even even if I've had ones that have are so similar. Even on on my chrono, and I take them down and I and I proof them at distance. So that's that's the biggest thing. You always have to shoot them at that at that five six hundred um, to figure out. And you can kind of go back and forth and figure out which one's a little bit better than the mm-hmm. other one. They're always the, the bolts will tell you. You know the bolts don't lie. Um, it's wherever you put the cross. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, crosshairs um, on target, and you're and you're making sure all those shots are right because. I've done in the past too, where you got a lot. Uh, you want to do it on a day that's not a lot of mirage, because oh, sure. that that is just you, you don't learn anything on a, on a day yeah, with a pile yeah. of mirage at distance. You, it's it's not it's your early morning, uh, late evening mirage is down, um, and you're able to tell it because if not, you're gonna take you you have a chances if you do that on a, on a heavy mirage day of taking a a load that you develop and it and it was great and it was great on paper. But just from your shooting and from conditions, it tr- it supposedly now is a bad load, but in all reality, it was a great load. Right? You're yeah. just skewing your data from with oh, bad I see. example. Yeah. yeah, there's there. He brought up a very good thing, and this is this is something that my mentor, that Jacob Bynum down at Rifles Only, has been teaching and, and training people for decades. You got to believe the bullet, and this is where the any chronograph will only get you your measurement, your statistical data, all that data at that point where it's the sensors are at. It can't account for things going on downrange. It can't account for, you know, variations in bullet coefficient, uh, you know, thermal pocket, shooting over water, wind, compounding wind um, directions and speeds. It can't. So once you get that data off your chronograph and you've done your velocity ladder, your OCW, and then you go to traditional ladder test at distance. Once you've completed those three, whatever three you want to do, you have to go out and true your velocity and true your BC. Oh, so we've done all those three steps. Now we got to go and do. This is the last test. The last test. Because all these tests, you haven't adjusted your velocity because chronographs do have deviations now. Well, I'm, ours reads 99.5 to 99.9. There is a percentage of deviation. No chronograph will ever read 100%. Okay. Hornady's multi $100,000 billion dollar system still has deviation built into it. All chronographs have deviation built into it. Ours, Lap Radar, all the optical, uh, op- optical systems out there, there is some deviation in there. But again, all these chronographs get you data at the sensor muzzle, unless it's a Doppler radar that can go all the way down range, like like Hornady's. And there, there's how they're doing the Ford off is a completely new ball game on yeah, things. Yeah, so it sounds so, like. So that data on all, all our system, Lab Radar, and everyone else's only gets you that data right there. You have to true your velocity because you've got to believe the bullet. The bullet's not going to lie. So, you know, down range, you had 2950 put in, but in reality, it's 2970 or 29 flat. And what that number you're talking about is the velocity. The velocity. Twenty nine hundred okay. feet per second. Was that sorry, was that at the muzzle or you said downrange? No. So truing your velocity, you get the you get the data from the chronograph, whether it's five feet out or at the muzzle with the, the bayonet and the chronograph. Um, but when you shoot downrange, you're adjusting the velocity 
to match where your impacts are at. In your bullet oh, I see. So in your, in your, in, in your, in your Kestrel yeah. and in your app or whatever, you're matching it. So a rule of thumb is that if you are shooting all these six millimeters, seven to 800 yards to zero yards in, you adjust velocity. Once you start going past 900 is when you start toying with the, the, the bullet coefficient. Oh, huh. okay. All right, because l- let's say this. You have all these bullet manufacturers. They, they tested all these bullets or they went to an independent lab, and they have a marketed BC that comes out from manufacturers. Yes. Well, that's with their rifle at their conditions at their location. And marketing. I use quotation marks. Marketing. Because right. now they're competing. Sarah's competing against Hornady. Hornady's competing against... Uh, they're all competing against each other to have the best BC bullet. But your rifle might like that Hornady bullet better than it likes that Sierra bullet. And the BC might be not the same as what's published. So mm. you have to true your velocity and BC. And this is the exact the, the last step in this whole process. Well, and the you, other thing I, I want to touch on, because we were just talking about BCs, is the fact the fact of what a ballistic coefficient really is, 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 is a measurement based on a, 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 a particular bullet. It is a drag, um, a, a drag model. Um, so if you look at a G1 BC, it looks kind of just like a, a cone, kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually just based off of, a, a very old bullet design. It kind of looks a lot like a, a mini ball. It's like uh, it's like uh, handsomeness. There's one general human being that everybody is like our <laughs> G1 for handsomeness, and we all try to look like Denzel Washington. And then there's what's called the G7, which is a lot more uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot more looks a lot more like a VLD bullet like we use now. Um, the the problem with even that is that not all bullets are exactly the same shape, so you're you're always basing it off of a model. Um, it's one of the things like uh, the guys at Applied Ballistics are using a custom right, drag right. model, which is exactly a model of your bullet that you're using, so you don't have that deviation. Um, if I'm using, uh, with how I have my Kestrel setup, I have a custom drag model for it, and, and it doesn't say like point two three. it says 1.0, because it's based on my exact bullet. Hmm. Um, so when every time you're using a drag model, you gotta keep into consideration, especially once you start dropping below the sound barrier, past your transonic zone, uh, now you need, you, you, if there's a chance that you're gonna have to start adjusting, um, it's your, um, I mean, drop scale factor, I believe, is what it's called. Um, yeah, drop scale factor, which is uh, essentially changing what the value that VC holds in the equation. So, to yeah, we're in the weeds now. To, so <laughs> we, we are getting we are good. getting into it. That's good because we awesome. like going into the weeds, but then we also like bringing ourselves out. So to get yep. into this final test, what we've done at this point is we we've plugged something into our ballistics calculator at this point, and so now we're going through this this true up where we're going to use the data that our ballistics calculator spit out, but then we're going to see if it's actually correct. Is that correct? You're just confirming it. We're just confirming it. And so if you start noticing, you know, okay, yep, 100 yards, 200 yards, yep, 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 300 yards, and then at 400 yards, things start getting a little bit weird, and then 500 yards, it start. you're like, okay, actually, it seems like my ballistic solver, what it spit out, what I gave it to spit out is a little bit off. Now, what do you do then to, to reverse it? So do you see where... You believe the bullet. Right. What do you, what do you, you said you change the velocity. So do you just start like tweaking the velocity a little bit until, until it starts matching up with so what you're doing? Just, just imagine, cause I know this is an audio show. Just imagine you have your true trajectory line mm-hmm. and you're trying to match up what your algorithm trajectory line and your true trajectory line are yes. all the way out to the target, the longest target you have. So you're just matching them up. And you just start tweaking that velocity number. Uh, again, like you said, maybe if it's within a certain distance, you start tweaking that until the distances that it spits out or the inches of drop that it spits out match up with what you're actually seeing. Correct. Correct. And then you can you can semi-safely assume. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you ever want to say fully, yep, 100%, but it, you can at least close to safely assume that I've based all of this on what's actually happening in real life. Your ballistic so. calculator will more, much more accurately predict what's actually going to happen in the correct set of circumstances. And a big thing to really make sure that you're very careful about is before you start adjusting your velocity or your BC in your ballistic calculator, make sure that everything that you have input into that program is one hundred percent. Just go in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that is. I mean, uh, making sure that. Oh my gosh. Making yes. sure that your BC 
is mm-hmm. actually based on what the manufacturer is saying, start off with, you know, obviously if that needs to be tweaked at some point, it can be tweaked, but making sure that's correct to start off with, making sure that your height over bore is correct, making sure, I mean, just yeah. uh, your atmosphere condition, that's a huge one. I, I don't know how many times that I have left my Kestrel in a car and it's reading 140 degrees Fahrenheit with 100% humidity and I take it out to the range and it's like, well, you know, I don't have to uh, add as much dr- drop in Scorcher today. Yeah. Scorcher <laughs> today. And, and my, my information is wrong. I'm like, oh, shoot, okay, go back to live, give her a couple of spins, acclimate it. Okay, now my stuff's actually hitting. But those little uh, dummy things that human error yeah. can mess it up. We so were just, we were always just out. Always triple check. Yeah, we were just <laughs> out at the range, and I was telling somebody uh, to dial certain amounts, and I remember that all, all the inputs I was giving them were from zero. So if they were at 300, and then I told them now dial to... 4.5 it was still from zero but they just kept adding it and oh. compounding it on top <laughs> yeah. of the last the last measurement that i gave them so all of a sudden they're like shooting into the rafters and i'm like we're about to like go over the i'm like what's going on with this thing i was like <laughs> yep. how much did you dial and i look at this thing i'm like oh no you added everything i yeah. said to oh you yeah oh far. you're at 72 yeah. right yeah. now yeah I, to to hit on what nick just said it you have to make sure those variables are correct mm-hmm. uh yeah, uh, how many times I get the phone calls? Hey, your chronograph's not giving me accurate velocity. I'm like, okay, let's diagnose this. Let's go through the step. You had it mounted correctly. It's it's set up correctly. Yes, yes, yes. And we've confirmed all that. Um, hey, in your ballistic solution, what's your scope over bore height? And then I get the deafening silence. What's that? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have that wrong, or if you have your your zeroing range wrong, or if you have yeah, your DC. Mix Elevation. matching G1 and G7 yep. because you have G1 drag model selected, but you have a G7BC bullet inputted. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. That's going to be off. So I've, I mean, interesting. And that'll put you off at yeah. distance along a full target, maybe even two. <laughs> For a person that wants to measure their scope over bore height, how would they do that? A couple That's different so ways simple. you can do it. Um, <laughs> me, I take a measuring tape, go from the middle of the scope to where my bolt is at, where the actual firing pin is, mm-hmm. and I sit there and visualize it, and if it's within, it's, eyeball it. Yeah. Okay. You got to be you gotta It doesn't be have pretty to be close. Exact. You got to make yeah, sure that the leveling, be. like if you're going to put the rifle on its side, make sure the tape is level, because if you start doing it off a table and you're angling the, away from you, you're going to get a false positive. If it's and, if it's an inch and a half though, and you're inputting three inches, then yeah. you're going to get some goofy stuff. But you don't have to be with. If you miss it by a quarter, it you're doesn't going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. Tenth to a quarter, you're going to be fine. At half or at, at <laughs> yeah. the further you go in long range shooting, the more your inputs, inputs and your right. variables, if you have mistakes in them, are going to show. Right. And That's why exactly. the another fast way of doing it is just taking your. I mean, if you're reloading anyway, you have this great little thing called a caliper. Yep. Take your caliper, oh, run yeah. it up and put your center point on the center uh, center in your windage knob. Run, just run it out. Push it. You know, make sure you put it to inches um, <laughs> instead of me- instead of millimeters. <laughs> yep. Um, run it down. Just run it down like Ryan said. Put it in the center of your bolt. Run your bolt back. Set run it to the center and look up and go. Oh, that's what it is. If you look plug at um, yeah, uh, most most rifles will have a, a gas port of some sort on the side of the action. Uh, a perfect example is a Remington Seven Hundred has one exactly halfway the barrel height. So oh. if you put the center of your calipers on that little gas port and then mm-hmm. put it on the center of your scope, now you have your exact height overboard. Nice. Uh, yeah. That's pretty So slick. That, that's a big one. And then the correct BC, the twist rate. I know people that have, a, is your twist rate correct in your al- algorithm? Oh, I always forget the freaking twist rate. <laughs> I always screw that up. I've had people calling like, yeah, I'm shooting a 308 and I got a, a 1 in 7, 7 twist rate. I'm like, let's let's look at that again. You sure you got a 1 in 7, 7 twist rate? Uh, yeah. And I'm like, so what projectile are you shooting? What's your barrel twist? Oh, one in 10. I'm like, there you go. Oops. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, if I were to throw a real monkey wrench in this for you guys, we're going to be doing a lot of this testing in Wisconsin at 900, maybe feet of elevation. We're going to go shoot a match at, what is it like out there? Oh, like sixty nine hundred, six to seven. Yeah, depending on where we're at. Well, of elevation, so we're going up about six Gs in elevation. Yeah, and I'm sure there's going to be a pretty serious um, difference in humidity. It's yeah. actually a lot easier than you think. Do we just like? Uh, do we just take our elevation, go to the weather station, figure out what humidity is, and just 
s- substitute. Yeah. Take your weather device with you. Um, Take something I, 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 like Kestrel. a Kestrel yeah. or a weather meter, get your density altitude, and be done with it. Yep. Oh, that's pretty much that's it. it. And done. then just done. Don't do sit a there and try it or something. Don't. Or? The old school method was density altitude is a combination of variables that right, gives you right. just do density altitude. All right. All you need is your direction of fire, your wind direction, the speed, density, altitude. You're done. That wasn't Get. a monkey wrench. They were ready for it. Because mm. it, it's, it's honestly most good programs these days. <laughs> they will automatically account for it. If you, especially another interesting thing that we kind of we were talking about um, the the beginnings of the low development and stuff. Um, and maybe it's just laziness on my part, but I always start off with a very temperature stable powder because if I do my mm-hmm. low development at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, I want to know that I'm going to be pretty dang close when it hits at zero degrees Fahrenheit or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's a great place to start. But even in most ballistic calculators, you can put in um, powder temperature variance. So if you know that on average that you increase by one foot per second per 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you can input that in there. And hmm. when you actually put your, your data in or when you, uh, when you acclimate your weather meter, your Kestrel, whatever you're using, to the ambient air, it'll automatically change your muzzle velocity based on that. Fantastic. Yeah. So in Texas, when we do load development, we have two two seasons, hot and not hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, wintertime when I do load development, but when it comes like May and I'm running the same barrel – and pow- same lot of powder and everything, I'll go out there and do another round because 50 degrees versus 90 degrees, 1,400 DA versus 3,000 or zero DA, you're going to start to see velocity changes. Yeah. And a lot of people don't, they don't take the time to do that, and then all of a sudden their, their whole algorithm's off. So right. if you're in a place that has wide temperature shifts and seasons, which is basically all of the United States, um, you do need to do that. Uh, some people say, well, no, you don't. You, you know, just to, uh, the more you do it, the more you know what you need to adjust and what you don't have to really tinker with, and your, yeah. your process becomes much shorter. So I remember seven years ago, my process was yay long from the width of this table. Now it's just where this pen's sitting. Right. That's, I've truncated it through experience. And, you know, 10 years from now, it's probably going to be shorter than that. Right. So... It's funny you mentioned that about Texas because in Wisconsin we have two seasons as well. It's winter and road construction. And actually <laughs> actually, both of those affect your accuracy too because in the winter the temperature will change dramatically, dramatically which will affect your ballistics. And in the summer when it's road construction, you're all pissed off and rushed because you were in traffic forever <laughs> at the range. So it, that affects your accuracy too. Yeah, would you get down to negative 40 this year in the winter? <laughs> we're at 90 oh. right now. Yep, yeah. yep. After after talking through all this, particularly this last part, I'm reflecting back on a hunt I was on this last fall where I got spot on dope chart, you know, adjusted my stuff, um, you know, for the veloc or excuse me for the elevation that I anticipated being at. Um, but the one thing that did change, you know, pretty dramatically was the temperature. Like it ended up being a lot colder than what I had anticipated, and I shot just underneath a buck that like I like if you'd have told me I was gonna miss that deer like I'd have told you you're out of your mind because it was like I mean it wasn't a like a super far shot but I think it was like I don't know 354 some, somewhere in there right yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean everything was perfect it was if you're just looking right at underneath it, them, and I'm thinking it was that temperature. It, it, it's totally possible. So uh, density altitude itself is, is broken up. It's a combination of uh, pressure, um, a temperature, and humidity. And in all honesty, if you know what the temperature and the pressure are, you, you're pretty close. Uh, humidity is a factor. But it's a small enough factor that if you threw out the equation, you're still probably not going to miss. Okay. So yeah. it, it's probably one of those two things. Um, if if, if uh, when that data sheet was printed up, if somebody accidentally put in, you know, uh, the wrong um, barometric pressure, or if uh, the the temperature itself was quite a bit different than what it you know was printed right. up at, those are the two biggest factors that you'd have to worry about when it comes to that. And to wrap this whole process up, now that you're out hitting targets, you have and you're shooting small little six millimeters and six fives at steel that's very far away and spotters can't see it. You need T one thousands on the target. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! 
fantastic. Which how long have you been waiting to do that? I, I, I had this. I had this whole thing planned out. Just, man. just, 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 just I sat down. Out. It's like, and, I, and I'm not even done yet. There's still more. It's like <laughs> um, watching a beautiful mind, or I don't know, like. <laughs> Law-abiding citizen, where you realize he's had it in his plan the entire time. I feel like Ryan pulls a string and my arm does this. <laughs> you know? Right, right. right. We if have it goes out of the extreme, yeah. don't we? The, when you hit the target, the little, oh, yeah. little red thing lights it's up. It's awesome. It's amazing. You know, and I tell you what, the the one thing that it, um, well, number one, it just helps you see an impact, and it gives everybody an affirmative. You know, sometimes there can be a dispute. You know that hey, I that think was... I hit that. You know, like you said, and and actually. You know, you talk about a, uh, a situation where a person's like, I know I hit that target. But with, like you said, with those small six millimeters, they're, you know, it can be light it's striking got- bullets. They're not big bullets. If a target's been uh, hammered on, you know, you're not going right. to see that splash. So Tiny it's bullets. getting as match, as match directors challenge more with smaller targets, further ranges. Certain matches have that flavor. Certain matches need the T1000s there. Yeah. Or some type of or, or ROs or something cameras on. You you have to have some type of validation. Other matches, honestly, and I'll be very honest, you don't need them because that certain match director has targets that are very re- reactive. And they move a lot. The ranges are closer. There's not a lot of mirage. Experienced ROs. Experienced RO. There. That's sure. the human factor. Much experienced. <laughs> yeah. ROs that actually know what happens when there's a, a graze or a side hit. In the sure. Pit. Because mm-hmm. I've seen uh, that wasn't an impact. I'm like, meanwhile, three mils off to the left, there was dust that went up. I'm like, that was that was a deflection, yeah. right? Well, or when they hit like five, and you're looking through there, and and then like the sixth one for some reason, and then seven out of ten rounds, they hit the first five. All of a sudden, round six goes away right, and then he, and then the the next four he hits, you know, center where yeah. you've seen that before, where you're like, oh wait a minute, that one definitely was a hit. If he hit. He went. He went nine out of ten, and the other one went two mils to the right. Right. Like, yeah. Eh, that's it's probably yeah. definitely a hit. So, and that's that's where the experience of ROs. And trust me, it's I've been frustrated where I've dropped one, and it's been. I knew that was a deflection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah, that I mean that completely mitigates it. It's hard, you know. And at the same time, too, it's hard to like get mad at inexperienced ROs because it's like you're volunteering. No. Correct. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, then, absolutely. but then that's where that's where like Do we not have all, argue with the ROs. We have all they're, they're doing their best. We have all <laughs> volunteers yeah. out of the extreme. Absolutely. But conveniently we also have those light up things. The yep. the thousand things. We're gonna, gonna be sending in. the 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 ten pack. We have a loner match pack that we send to matches. Um, that's upon request, and that that schedule fills up pretty quick. But I have blocked you guys off for ten, and you're getting the new ones, the, oh, the T one thousand A's. Oh man! So these A-mom. you don't. And f- people familiar with the T one thousands and match directors are familiar that you had to take them to change any of the settings. You had four little switches inside of the the data board that you had to change. Um, we send out the ones in the match pack already done and ready for the matches. But if you bought any individual ones commercially, you had to change those settings Mm -hmm. so that the missing indicator didn't go off when you're shooting because it's kind of confusing when you have red and yellow lights going off and the ROs get kind of confused. You want only the hit indicator on. Yeah. Yes. With the new T-1000As, you actually can program them without taking them off the target with an app that transmits sound into the T-1000 and you can sit there and adjust the the pulse rate, the length, the time, and then the sensitivity. So, and that's all in the app, and you can actually sit there and program them to how quickly you want them to flash and then stop if you want the, the long flash, whatever. So, how about that? Yep. This podcast brought to you by <laughs> Magneto's. <laughs> and then Mark, last, <laughs> lastly... Did you expect anything you good? Didn't say, Mark didn't say... <laughs> mos- oh, yeah. You didn't say mosquito speed once. Not once. On this mosquito speed. Speaking of mosquito or annoying noises, we have the rifle cool. You have the rifle what? The rifle cool. cool. Oh, cool. yeah, what? sure. So we have a device... I mean, I don't know, but I know what you're talking about. A device that fits in the chamber that will take the ambient air from outside and push it down your board or cool your board down between stages. And it's one of the most Wait, beloved... What? Yeah. You don't want to run a... It's like Barrel shooting. heats up, metal droops, yeah, and you yeah. start losing accuracy and you lose velocity. So you want to try to keep your barrel as cool as possible. It's like AC for your rifle? Yeah. There you go. Exactly. And it's loud, and everyone loves it. Oh, yeah! Sounds like a lot of <laughs> pissed off bumblebees. See, I want yeah. one. Yeah. I want one. There you go. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> you know a guy. 
Well, excellent. I, I can't believe it, but I actually think, Mark, that going into now reloading this our own ammunition, I think maybe I actually sort of have an idea of what we're going to do. I think we're getting there. I don't. I don't want to say like I actually know what we're going to do because I. Well, I think I don't it's going to take. I don't want to be that confident just yet, but that was actually the best explained like process of testing I think I've ever heard. Yeah, we'll find out when we do it. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, any any final closing thoughts from the amazing guests from today? Um, I'll say this. All right. Going through the process of, of what we probably talked about, I will say this, reloading is not hard. Um, it is, even it, it's intimidating, I'm sure, but it, it is not hard once you do it to the point where I brought people over. Like, oh, you reload your own rounds? Oh, yep, come on over. So they come over there and they're like, well, I want to do it. And then I do it and they're like, wait a minute, that's it? <laughs> like, that's all you really do? And I'm like, that, that's, that's it. It's not, it's not a magical piece. Um, it's not it's not hard at at all. The the it's, I said it's intimidating, but once you do it, you're gonna sit there and go, "Wow, this I really probably sweated over something I didn't need to sweat over." Awesome. So it's and it's and it is kind of relaxing after a while. It's nice to be able to produce your own rounds that and to, and to see kind of the 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 fruit of yeah. of your bounty maybe uh, of of being able to to see what you're able to get your gun to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I said, my rifle will hold I Francis, uh, a crew out at, uh, cool rifles in California that does my gun. And he builds on a point where I know that if I'm shooting, if they don't shoot five shots in the size of a dime, then I rework my ammo. But the nice part about the process of getting those rounds to do that is awesome. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Cause you already know the gun's going to do it. Can you, can you make, now can you do your end? The gunsmith did his job. Can you make the gun do what the gunsmith made the rifle capable of doing? So the accuracy you'll see is phenomenal. It's it's it's, it's it is it's 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 kind of that internal, you know. It, to add on it, to what you're fulfilling. saying, there, yeah, it's fulfilling. It, it it's really fulfilling. is. You'll, it you'll is receive fulfilling. such a, a huge amount of joy and success and, and happiness from from doing all that, and it's it's really not work because it's actually quite soothing. If it, it, the only time it becomes work is when you have to do a mm-hmm. huge amount of it, and yes. you're yeah. <laughs> just like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, and but <laughs> the load development itself, once you see, as Tony said, the fruits of the labor, uh, you see that tiny little group and this such high performance, and it's just like it's made for you. It makes it, yeah, it, the the joy you feel from that is it, it, it's fulfilling. Even if you, mm-hmm. even if you as the human shoot bad, but you know your ammo is good. It's, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it's still you still know your rifle can you you can't outshoot your rifle. You can out outshoot the ammo that you made, and you have bad stages. That's n- I still have a fulfilling feeling that I created these rounds. I did this whole process. I followed through with something. It I know it's good. But I just need to tweak the human side of it. Mm-hmm. That is still a fulfilling process to me. Yeah. And sometimes it comes together and you get a top 10, a top 20, or win matches. I mean, look at Matt Perso. He's a, it's coming together for him consistently, constantly. And right. it's because he's put the time in and he's done the homework. And, he, you know, Dave Preston, Matt Perso, Tate Streeter, all these guys that are going to the AG Cup that were invited, you know, Regina. Uh, they they've put a lot of time into this, and they've they know that fulfillment that that feeling of fulfillment is starting from scratch and then taking a trophy home and confidence. Confidence there, is big. Thing, confidence yeah. is yeah. Huge. You know that your ammo is producing good results, then it, it it does help you along the way. Reloading uh, creates happiness, confidence, uh, self fulfillment. Pretty much, uh, I mean. It's like a it's therapists. A, if you're listening, sorry, <laughs> sorry, we we've, we've pretty. It's much a positive solved. catharsis until you blow something up. <laughs> yeah, and on that note, we're not all right. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, next up, we just got to actually load these suckers. So stay tuned on this pod venture. Well, Jim, I'm looking forward to it because apparently reloading is my new life coach. Yep. Thank you guys a ton for joining. We appreciate it. We thank, will thank uh, end this on the old classic. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye. I had to put that in. Uh, <laughs> you have a memory like no other. Like you can go off of every, what everyone said. Off I know. And without yeah. writing things down, I'm like, you recall. I'm doing you're, this. You're, you're doing the same thing. I'm like, I'm like, Jim, I don't know if you saw it, but we kept on kind of joking about somebody blowing themselves up.
He recently tried to remove his hand and part of his and leg. face, yeah, and leg and stomach. So what happened was, um, <laughs> I'm back still, off these reloading. Are still rolling. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, you know what? You could it, uh, use this as a safety thing. When you're reloading, you have to be safe about it. Yes. Um, one, I will not recommend if you're dealing with anything like the primers, uh, and you're going to have your kids around. Make sure they're wearing their eye pro and you're supervising them. I know a lot of parents want to have their kids involved to teach them, but you got to be safe because the very low statistical chance lightning strikes scenario that something happens, that we're all the bad stars align, you can have detonations. Mm -hmm. and that's what happened to me. Uh, impatience, along with mechanical, along with some things I still can't explain, um, I had a primer, and I was priming some small um, primer brass. I got a primer that flipped upside down on top of another primer that was right side up, and I squeezed them together. Oh. And they compacted together, and as soon as I let pressure off of the hand priming tool, they exploded. Whew. And it set a chain reaction off of the whole, the no. whole tray. No. tray. So now I have 130 small rifle primers that went off. Uh, One small primer. Yeah. is a pop. 130 of them is like putting a flash band in your face with shrapnel. Well, you you undersell that. It's a, it's a pop that'll make your ears ring. It's like yes. a firecracker going off. Yeah, yeah. Head. So the 130 that went off was being inside. And I've, I've been in a room and been flash banged before, and it was... Because now I had shrapnel in me. I, I still had burning primer material on my oh, hand shit. here stomach and inside my leg and the primer tray cover the plastic the clear plastic went straight up into my ceiling and missed my face by two inches literally a chunk got lodged in your ceiling didn't it huh didn't a chunk get lodged in your ceiling yeah like half Whoa. of the primer tray went up the velo the the explosion was that violent that it pushed it up yeah. and put it in about Three quarters of an inch into the so wear your eye pro wear your eye pro yeah. and, okay and and wear i'm eye guilty pro. And not of that only too. that a lot of a lot of them a lot of guys want to see it and they hold they hold it like this because after a while like nick was saying your thumbs get beyond sore. oh yeah because i yeah. used to i used to do it i used to hand prime i don't do it anymore i i go i have an rcbs uh one guy taught me he goes i was like because after a while my wrist your wrist hurt your arms hurt you're just doing so because i because yeah. i do again i do one ten lots so i'll do if i have my my brass ready to go. I do everything. I size all my brass at the same time. So I'll 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 shoot all every piece of brass I got. I run it back through at one go. I run through a single stage press. So I'll have eight nine hundred rounds that I'll have to run through a single stage press at one time. Whew. So then I go through all primer lots and I'll and I'll run all my primers at one go. Well, that time you're but by the end of it you're like with a hammer you're like oh come yeah. on yeah <laughs> come on you know but and so I. Um, one, one of the guys says, go get the RCBS one, the one with the tube. And yep. it's it's a tube. The nice part about it is that there's no, all you do is you literally, have you ever seen it before? So if you do so. come up, so it's got that tube on it comes over. And so it, when he's talking about detonation, oh, okay. it's the chance, it, there's no chance of inter, of, dis, of your disc um, detonating. Yeah. Because if you send one, it'll go over top. The biggest thing is that when people have these hand primers, they're like this all the time. Yep. Well, if you they're, cook that thing through, that I mean, you got to think of it, it's blowing straight up out of that yeah, brass. The, the, the weakest, the, the, the path of least resistance is right, the piece of brass. is right is right up through the, the plastic tray cover. And yeah. when I prime, because I'm trying to get all everything to feed into the, the fill hole and onto the, the ram, I'm angled out. Mm -hmm. That's what saved me. Because if I would have had it in like this watching, that plastic one went up in my face. And, yeah. Makes I you appreciate a good priming tool too. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. just because if you use um, a, some of the, I have my first priming tool, you get through about 40 of them and your hand is cooked. Yeah, it's my, my, the one I use now is a RCBS Universal Hand Primer and it is. It's, the the horny, hand prime? It is still, yeah. yeah it's no, the the horny one I was using, I, I went mm. out and bought a replacement. I had to get some data, so I had to use, I already had one. I went out yeah. and bought a replacement and then took the parts off of the exploded one. I had to start doing this whole big in-depth thing at work then we were measuring we were looking at you know what what could possibly cause this getting I mean we, I went full CSI on this <laughs> um, talked to the brass manufacturer even RCBS because I was using their shell plate Hornady Federal because I was using Federal primers and you know of course all of them were like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I got right. I knew that was gonna happen I wasn't trying to get anything free wasn't gonna do any lawsuits litigation I wanted to prevent this from happening 
the number one factor preventing this was human factor of being patient and not trying to squeeze something that wasn't supposed to go. Yeah. Because that's what initially started. Yeah. If you if you're hand priming, especially if you're because you, you'll you'll develop a, a feel. Like if you do ten of them in a row, you, the amount oh. of pressure is going to be almost exactly, smooth. and it's going to be smooth. very smooth. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Please. Yeah. No, and don't have your kids in the room. Yeah. Right. My daughter was in the other room. I was in the living room. And she was over in the other room. And pop. I was, we had the in-laws over because it was my father-in-law's birthday. It was my anniversary, by the way, too. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Right. That, that went over really good with the I'm wife. sure. Uh, my wife thought I had shot myself. And I'm like, yeah. thanks, honey. I'm not doing that bad on things. You're not driving me that nuts. She's like, I thought you were playing the gun and you shot yourself. Oh, my God. I'm like, no, the primer tool exploded. Um, my daughter's like, what were the balloons going off? She was all like, I was party <laughs> popping going right. off. I'm like, I'm okay, Riley. My thumb's burning, but I'm okay. Well, put it underwater, Daddy. I'm like, all right, thanks, honey. So um, I did get, my wife did take me to the ER because I was, I still had, it was still burning. Yeah. Stuff was still physically Wild burning gosh. in my thumb and this whole skin flap. I didn't realize that I had missed the, the plastic thing. I got back home and I looked up Sunday night and I'm like, whoa, okay. There it is. There, there it is because I had all the pieces and I'm well, like. That's not my face. And I, I you know, I, hey, hun, look at that. And she's like, oh, my God, because we looked at where I was sitting versus that. And it, I mean, I'm talking. Yeah. Very close. Very close. Ooh. So be safe when you, and that also goes in with, with power um be very careful with what you have around when you're when you're dropping your powder yeah. i mean mm-hmm. we, we want to have our cell phones near us we want to have electronics near us we want to have you know if you're a cigarette smoker <laughs> forget that i've seen people on these reloading websites and forums they have their ashtray right there and then they got eight pounds of powder right here i'm like no please <laughs> yeah. yeah the other thing and we we kind of hit on it was pressure signs. Really heed that warning too. If you're out testing loads and you start seeing pressure signs, especially if you ever blow a primer, stop. Stop. Pull those bullets. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do any more above that charge weight or at that charge weight. It's it, you're getting to a dangerous point. Yeah. On the flip side of that, if you have a squib and you feel that light pop and it didn't feel it didn't yeah. feel like a full launch ignition. So, to be very honest with you, when you for, you're done, you forgot powder, you forgot powder or yep. you had a half charge in there. Enough to push that bullet into the chambering but not get it through the barrel. Oh, yeah, don't just go and put another one in and then... Well, that happened. Yeah. Uh, there was a shooter down in Florida that he had the, the bullet went in far enough to where it didn't, the tip of the next round came, launched it and it blew his... Did that ever oh happen? Did, did they figure out what happened with Janae's gun? Janae had her gun blow up at, and Tate had to give her a gun. I didn't hear about Janae's gun yeah, blowing Janae's up. Yeah, Janae's gun detonated when? on her. Um, at, what match is that? I this year? I didn't, yeah. I didn't hear about it. I didn't hear about it. See, that's why I like, I, this is why we're good on hearing about it, because it wasn't blasted out. So yeah, yeah. That yeah. was good. Um, Luke, yeah, she told me about it. So Luke Goodry's good. rifle, I was there and saw him chamber, and you hear pop, and he he thought it was just, uh, you know, and no one caught it, and I didn't even notice it. And I'm the next stage over, next squad over, and then it, Boom! And it split yeah. his action. He, he, he split. His, it shredded his rifle, it, it, it and it hit his been, face. It probably should have been. Yeah, it was. That could have been a lot. Oh, it was he bad. Because he had a little bit of frag. Yeah, he had frag on but his it face. Could have been a lot worse. It could have been. Mm-hmm. The action did what it was supposed to do and absorbed a lot of that blast. I've seen a lot of times people using just like, uh, you know, I've seen PMRs hold guns together, mm-hmm. like the rings too. Like yep. Because a lot of times oh, it yeah. cracks down the top. Who's of the, the guy? We did that video on, he had the that tan rifle, there, he so blew, it, blew up his rifle. I guarantee that's what happened. Yeah. Because I believe oh, yeah. he was even talking about hand. He was talking about reload, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I've, I've yeah. squibbed one before and I was just unbelievably pissed off because I thought it ruined my rifle because I had to get a wooden dowel and hammer it out from the other uh, side. Okay, that was my <laughs> yeah. next question. Yeah. How do you get it out? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got to get a wooden dowel and hammer it out. Don't use, I mean, you don't can... Use Rod. Don't, don't use clean rod. Rod. Don't, don't use metal. Just just hammer it out metal. the way. Your wooden dowel. Wooden no. dowel or put it down the muzzle. And okay. And start knocking out. The reason why you action. want wood is it's not going to mess your lands and grooves up. Yep. You don't want metal. You don't want galling that inside. There is. There's going to be a chance that you're going to leave something in there just because you're hammering it through the the, the bore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you'd want something softer. I mean, nylon and plastic will burn up. Yep. It'll burn up in your bore. I've used the nylon cleaning rod nylon coated cleaning rod plus flex yeah and plus uh, dump the 
on a lube down there and just yeah. Yeah. Okay. knocking it out. Mm. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it, yeah, pretty much a squib is, is you're done because for the day. Right. Right. So you can get it out of there quickly and get back into shooting and your rifle doesn't need to re-zero it or anything. Um, it, it's what's one of those things because at a match, especially if you have something like that, it's a safety hazard. And that means the match director has to. You have to get doing. pulled. They pull you. Yeah. And, you know, trigger goes down. You can replace a trigger or firing pin. Yeah. And be back on the next stage. But are you, are you guys in uh, out in uh, the Vortex stream? Are you guys shooting a lot of like canyon type stuff? Mm -hmm. Your updraft you're going to have down there too. That's true. Uh, they're not yeah. going to be getting out to super long ranges though. So they, they, although they will have updraft, I don't think I that. Don't the average yeah, shot's like 400 yards. Oh, is it? What's, what's 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 the that? furthest shot is 13. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah I, I missed an odd ad in Texas when we were talking about the shit on. Yeah. 605. Really? Updraft? By, up, and I was like, I didn't realize, got down, staring at the animal, make sure that didn't lose it, right? It's like, that's the one, that's the one. There's a herd there. To Mark's been out there, he knows how big. There was a herd of 50, the biggest one we ever saw out there. He's an old guy in the group. And to the point where the guy that we had, he's like, can you make that shot? I was like, absolutely, I've been shooting just seven, eight, you know, with the gun, I was shooting a 3 one mag. Yeah, no problem, mm -hmm. not, not a problem. I got down, same exact way, you were talking about the, your, your whitetail. And I got I got down, prone, perfect. Couldn't have asked for anything, I could have never asked in a million years right. better, best shot, prone. I bagged the whole nine yards. <laughs> and cross right him, he, he was, I can't even say he was quite, slightly quarter. He was as 90 degrees me as possible. <laughs> Put the crossers on him. Boom. Guy goes, he messed over top. To the point where, no kidding, I'm laying yeah. prone. I look at him and I go, are you kidding me? Like, to the point where I was like, there's no way. Right. Like, you saw something right. odd. Sure enough, that animal <laughs> walked, <laughs> ran away, got intermixed with all the other ones. I couldn't shoot at him again. So the updraft, is that like wind right. swirling so, around so inside the canyon? The it's kind of creating a... The best way of, saying, of, think, of thinking like for your winds and stuff is, uh, and like I've been told this one as well, is that think of like how water flows. Mm -hmm. Water so, and wind are pretty, pretty much, much the same. So yeah. as you're going down through a canyon, you get a, a right... Because this is what happened. I was didn't look down, didn't even realize I was exploring on top of a hill. Didn't even like, happen to like look down slightly. But these, these are deep canyons in Texas down there. And it, it was just a push from wind was going... Remember, right to left and it just it what it does it creates all that water so you're up top it's, it's just pushing all this so by the time it, uh, the length of the canyon it blows your bullets higher blow 99.99% of the time it's going to your rounds are going to go high yeah. so I've never I don't think I've ever had wind a going up it's yeah. going to push your bullet up yeah. so yeah. if you're it's, shooting with the wind and you have an updraft going up your bullets going to get pushed up yeah. if you're shooting into the wind and that that wind is coming down it's gonna yeah. push down. Oh, and yeah. heat stroke, I learned this very painfully, but it, it, the match is called heat stroke. It's actually this oh, weekend oh, in Oklahoma. Okay. It's, not, it's, 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 it's always, no. there's no shade. <laughs> Medical you know, condition affects ballistics. They call the match heat stroke because okay, there's yeah. no shade and it's always hot. Um, You're gonna find out that this, this match this weekend should be called heat stroke. Heat the heat stroke is Look, I got a heat stroke last time I shot. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, it's supposed to be getting hot. One ten with like in Wisconsin humidity is. It's just pretty like, hard. It's like it's like walking underneath. It's only supposed a, to be ninety seven. Warm, damp blanket on Friday tomorrow. Only ninety seven. Only ninety seven. I've, for, I've forgotten over over the years on on the. the You're gonna I barely get back here in the summer. I'm gonna be. Like, I'm gonna feel at home. It's like, like no man. It's gonna yeah. be different. It's the no. humidity, dude. There I, is. It's I, like it's I like live running around with a damp, wet rag over. Your I am fifty miles from the coast. No, never mind. <laughs> fifty to hundred miles from the <laughs> Gulf yeah, he's Coast. Close down yeah, there. You're fine. Yeah, humidity. I'll, I'll be fine on. They're I actually like the dry heat. Really? Oh, I love the dry heat better than humidity. I, I oh, I would wait for sure. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Like, go to, go to Altus, the old core in Florida, when it's 100 and it's 100% humidity and everyone's it's just like in Georgia and it's like yeah. Fort Benning and you're like, and you just see the humidity just draping on things it's and you're horrible. like, ah. Oh. Well, 29 Palms is like, it's, it's a dry heat up there to the point where if it gets below 100 up there, it's a cold day. Um, and you're right running around at 120 yeah. degrees. But, MTC, but, Fort it's, but it's not, it's it's really odd. It's interesting, you, yeah. You, when you're sweating, you're sweating because you know, you're hot. Not because of humidity. Just give them a thumbs up. I had to make sure that we did good. Did we do good? Yeah. No beeps. No beeps. I yeah, that I didn't was beep, pretty yeah. impressive. Jim, Jim C beats me again. <laughs> <laughs>
You gotta give me about that. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will. Hopefully, you know. he listens to his podcast. I'm gonna have to go listen to that one again and get the count because I think I stopped counting. And <laughs> <laughs> I like how you threw the, uh, the the file in on. Yeah, that was a I, zing. I was. Oh my zing. gosh! All these. Uh, so he, <laughs> we were. We were, we were, we were I love, I love class, inside right? jokes. Yeah. I love to be a part of one someday. So we we were at <laughs> Altus training facility down in Florida. Oh my and gosh. What, what happened? I was shooting, uh, and my gun was shooting really well. So we end up, anyway, at the end, so I got some brass from another guy. <laughs> and I got some brass from another guy, and so he still tumbled. You guys, so you guys are using probably walnut, and you guys have a tumbling process? Oh, we have uh, actually steel. Steel? Yeah, steel, yeah. Okay. Steel. okay, so if you put them in there too long, it will roll your necks, well, the mouth. It'll, It'll roll, roll the, the mouth. Roll the mouth just ever so slightly, so you can't feel it so Kay. much. Yeah, and so I got this brass. I yeah, ran out of my lock. my one brass. So I'm like, I need another hundred rounds. And again, I shoot them in lots. I don't yeah. care how they are. I go down there, and sure enough, I go to start. I run the two, and I, I by the time I'd rolled into the extra hundred rounds of a lot, the guns won't run to the point where my hand, I still have the scars from it. Yeah, like I'm He's slamming my trying to get my bolt to close. And it's not closing. Like it's just, <laughs> and I know that they're feeding. I know there's no issues. Turns out that he had ran them through a steel tumbler too long, and it rolled the mouse out. So we had to sit there, and Buck, every one Buck of them. I, I, yeah. So we had, someone got a Leatherman, and we were filing the mouth out of these things. Like I walk over, and I see again. Tony sitting against a barricade, just. They're following the rounds. They have this whole thing. He's like, got blood all over his I'm, hands. I'm, I'm like, like, what are you doing? And Buck's sitting there filing down. Like, We're just rolling on this. On and this then thing. he said, yeah, peened, peened case mouth. And I'm like, ah, someone tumbled too long. Yeah. And then, and then I asked Richard, I, well, was Richard the one that gave me the brass? And I said, oh, I go, I go, did you? Because they were clean. I mean, they were shiny. I mean, so yeah. he gave me, like, brand of brass. You know, like, it's one fired hornet. And sure enough. He goes, yeah, I may have, I did still tumble them. Because someone had said something like, well, how'd you, how'd you tumble them? I still tumbled them. Long? Uh, maybe. Only four so hours. So ever since yeah. then, four I said, hours. never again. So chafer and deburring, <laughs> I don't care what happens. I will chafer and deburr from now ever, forever. I mean, it was a point where I had blood. Like, just <laughs> running to the side of my gun. The action looked like a, a murder this, scene. And this it brings, did. This well, brings and, uh, back. A lot of people, and some people do this, they'll have a friend help them out because they have a faster setup, and they, yeah. they, yeah. they're helping each other out. I am very much under the rule. When I let people offer me, hey, I'll, I'll help you do your brass. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I'd rather stay up late and me be responsible because, one, that avoids me going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad always uh, used to offer it. He's like, well, I'm bored in, at night. See, I can no. load some match ammo for you. No. Nope. Uh-uh. Nuh-uh. No. Nope. Uh-uh. Well, and, uh, and every no. one of those cases I've loaded is my name on it. No one else. Yeah. Yeah. Other people more comfortable. Like Prentice Wink down in Texas reloads for Jonathan Berry all the time. Yeah. He reloads for like five different people. And they're confident with it. And Jonathan yeah. goes out and wins, and it does great. So. Well, and we know from the what was it that one movie? If you get blood on your bullets, too, it'll jam up a bear fifty count. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spin <Spitting> rub. <laughs> All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.